Good afternoon. I'm Michael Markowitz, director of the Institute for Retired Professionals, which has been part of the new school for 49 years. At the Institute, we are a learning program in which retired and semi-retired people get together to build a <laughs> curriculum and to develop study groups in which all share responsibility. People become students in the IRP, and they look to learn the newest things. Most of the learning in the IRP is driven by the students in the IRP. Half a dozen times a year, we come together and we look at topics that we are curious about, topics which aren't co co suitable for covering in the uh, format of a study group, and we have these events. These events are a result of a gift given to us in memory of Estelle Tolkien, who was a frequent new school attendee. Uh, the gift made in memory of Estelle Tolkien has resulted in a 10 years of programs by, uh, at the IRP. And we will be coming back in the fall and the spring with an exciting 50th anniversary program. I'm going to ask Ava Vogel to come up here and to join me, join me for a moment. And I'm going to ask Jane Osma. Stand up. Well, stand up, please. These are the two people who, for the past year or so, have been very involved with programming for these Fridays at 1 and have really worked with a team of IRP students to develop a fine, fine program for the fall. So let's give them a hand. And I'm going to turn the floor over to Ava. Okay, welcome. Um, again, I would like to thank everybody who contributed to this program. It wasn't just two of us, but there's a whole crew of New School, Pam Tillis, and people who uh, help us with the programming. Uh, I am really glad that I have opportunity to introduce to you the topic of glass. It is my favorite, uh, <laughs> my favorite subject. Here is one of my colleagues. We work on it for about 30 years. And I still think it's very exciting and complicated material. It is a material that uh, uh, one can find in the nature, but you can find it uh, all around you. People start making glass, as I found it on the web in, I think, in 3500 BC. So glass is the old materials. You see glass everywhere. You see it in the, on the building, in the glass building. You see it on the cars. You see it in the kitchen. You see it in, on different screens. But there is glass places that you don't even think about. Fiber optics, uh, optical fibers, for example, are made of glass. Inside of computer chips, there is a glass. There is glass in some of us, for example, from the dental implants, from the bone graft. So glass is everywhere, and it's wonderful material. So let me introduce you Professor Pentano, who will uh, give us talk today about the glass. Um, he's what I call a renaissance man of uh, glass science. Uh, he's a great scientist and great teacher. He, got, uh, he has many publications. He has a patents. Uh, uh, he has all kind of awards for his scientific work. Uh, he's a professor at Penn State, uh, but he's also, he was also accepted by art community. And that's why it's interesting to see different aspects of the glass of science, scientific part, and art, artist part. Uh, he's an elected member of World Academy of Ceramics and was twice honored by the Glass Art Society as a Labino lecturer. Please welcome Professor Pantano. <laughs> Well, it's very nice to be here to tell you about one of my favorite subjects, glass, especially the art and science of glass. <clears throat> um, it's my first visit to the New School, so I hope you'll find what I have to say interesting. Um, this is what we're going to talk about, and I kind of broke the talk up into to three pieces. At the beginning, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about 
what motivated me to get involved with the art side of glass and how I'm using that motivation with my students at Penn State. And then I'd like to tell you a little bit about glass. I want you all to leave with just a little more scientific knowledge. There'll just be a short quiz at the back door before you can leave. <laughs> and then at the end, at the last third of it, I'd like to tell you about some interesting things that I think you might be interested in uh, in the amount of time that I have left. I could talk all afternoon. You may have to give me, give me the hook to get me off the podium. Um, but before I get started on art and science of glass, let me just tell you about my day job. Um, I'm a professor at Penn State University, and most of my work has to do with glass, but more perhaps from an engineering point of view. Um, my focus is the surface of glass, and I think today I, we all know that energy is a big driver in a lot of what's going on in technology, and glass has a lot to offer there, whether it's solar panels, uh, whether it's fiberglass insulation, whether it's fancy coatings to keep the cool air in our, inside of our buildings and keep the, the hot sun out, whether it's glasses that are used to replace uh, badly diseased bone, uh, they're so-called bioglasses. Uh, glass is now the ch material of choice for packaging pharmaceuticals. And then even the human genome, figuring out what we're made of at the genetic level was accomplished using DNA microarrays, which are glass chips on which genes, DNA was put in order to do that kind of work. So that's what I do most of the time, but today I'm going to broaden that and talk about the art and science of glass. And um, I guess one of my points in the first third of this talk is, you know, that art and science and technology uh, have had a successful collaboration over time. Not everybody is aware of it, and so that's one of the things I'd like to give you uh, some examples of. You know, artists and scientists have always had different missions but they had something in common, which is they had to create new things. And uh, I found it quite disturbing that at the university, the artists are over there, and the engineers and scientists are over here, and the students in art are not even encouraged by their faculty to go learn about science, and maybe vice versa. So I decided to see if I could make a little bit of change about that. And so I created a program uh, to try to get students to use both sides of their brain, which is one way I put it. And before I tell you a little bit about some of those kinds of things that the students are doing, I just thought I'd give you some examples that you may know about, but perhaps forgot about, that show the crossover between artists and scientists. But obsidian is a natural glass. It's a frozen volcanic magma, stuff that's pouring out of Mount Etna in Sicily right now. And when this glass cools and becomes a solid, because of the way it's flowing, it had this property that you could cleave it and make very, very sharp edges. And in fact, obsidian was used to make knives, you know, in the, in the formations of civilization. Looking for obsidian knives around the planet is still something that's popular to do because it's a, it, it traces civilization. People who had knives could take skins off of animals and things. And glass, which is what this is, a natural glass, it could be cleaved to make a very, very sharp edge. Sharper than you can sharpen a ceramic or a metal to make a knife. And in, even today, it's used by some heart surgeons because they believe that when they cut with obsidian, they get such a clean cut that the tissue uh, comes back together much more perfectly than it does with other materials. And again, obviously, that's uh, historians working together with uh, technologists. Maybe the most famous one, and my favorite example, is the Venetians were the first to come up with water white glass. Prior to the Venetians having that glass, always had kind of a gray tint to it because of impurities in the raw materials. The Venetians figured out how to make it clear. Turns out the Venetians were doing that on a small island in Venice called Murano, and Galileo was a professor. Today, 25-minute train ride in Padua from Venice. He heard about Murano and these people making glass. He had the idea about a telescope, but he didn't have the material. And if you go back and look at the history, it was he went over there and asked them for help in building a telescope, which allowed him to see the planets for the first time. And there are a few others that I'm going to talk more about as we go through the talk. The glass flowers up at Harvard, if you've never seen those. These are models of every flowering uh, plant and fruit known, about 3,000 different species, made out of glass to teach botany. So again, artists made the glass flowers. Scientists used them to teach students at Harvard at the turn of the century about uh, botany because in Boston, the weather's cold. You can't have a greenhouse. Uh, wax was used previously, but it didn't have the, 
the same feel as glass did. Uh, today, scientists are going to glass historians to ask them questions about how old glass has survived over the years. We want to bury nuclear waste in glass. I'll tell you a little bit about that. We need their help at, at this point. And I believe, and I've not seen it in writing, maybe Ava will have some suggestions on this, but I always use Venetian Morini as an example of a process for making something that I think the first people who made optical fibers got their ideas from. Uh, so kind of summarize my motivations and what I'm trying to do with the programs. You know, I see a widening gap between the public and science. I think I even heard about it a little bit around here. And I feel like this is one way to get kids and the public and non-science college majors comfortable with science, give them something that's a little more interesting. Um, Engineering students, over my 35 years of teaching, we use more and more computers. They touch things less and less. I felt like engineering students in my department were losing touch with physical reality of materials. So this was a chance to put material in their hands uh, while they were using computers. I'm not trying to downplay the importance of computers to engineering. I just wanted them to not lose touch with the reality of putting something in your hands and being creative with it. Um, it's an interdisciplinary thing. And interdisciplinary everything is the topic of the day. You know, barriers between different fields have come down, as we all know, social things, scientific things, political things, financial things, that those lines have all blurred. And I think our undergraduate students need to hear about that. And um, you know, there are a few other examples, but those are the key points. So I created some courses um, about glass blowing techniques and materials. Uh, I'm not trying to be an artist. I am not an artist and don't, don't claim to be. The classes have six art students and six engineering students. I'm trying to bring the students together to, to, to cross collaborate on the way they approach creativity. Um, it's not a class where you just get to make trinkets. You have to learn about science as well as learn about art. And one of the more interesting things I found by bringing art and engineering students together is you know, how they respond to things. So critiques, for example, artists are very used to standing in front of their piece and letting people critique it. Engineers had a hard time with that, really had a hard time. You know, looking at you guys and smiling because it's a different kind of a thing than we did in our field. So just show you some photos. I have a studio at Penn State. We have a different kind of an interaction. It's very different than standing in front of a blackboard, sitting around a table discussing. Uh, there's interaction between the students themselves as well as with me. Uh, with real things in our hands. Um, you know, here's an example, uh, again, of this, the difference. She, she's an art history major. He's an engineering student. We did, our, we did our exhibits at the end of the semester. Everybody has to make a piece and then defend it at, a, at an exhibit. You know, the engineering students always start with something logical, like solar energy or something symmetrical, and try to make art out of it, whereas the art students generally went the other way. But as I said, as we walked around the exhibits, Students had to talk about their stuff. There was clearly an uncomfortableness on the part of the engineering students, where the art makers, they were ready to talk about their stuff, and they didn't want to stop talking about what they had in mind when they created it. And I think that that's actually been helpful for the engineering students more than for the art students to really understand how you have to communicate verbally about what your ideas were, whether you achieve them. Uh, this program has been great for recruiting. Uh, underrepresented groups, women in particular into glass. I've found that they like it. We've had this women in science and engineering program now for seven or eight summers. And we get a lot of um, students come in from high school, um, give them the experience. So in this particular project, uh, each, each of the young ladies got to melt a different color glass. And then we fused all those pieces of glass together into a, a multicolored bar. And then we stretched it into a fiber. And we made little barcodes. Little barcodes actually have applications. You can mix them in. Oops, sorry. You can mix them into uh, drugs, explosives, and use them for tracking. Just like a barcode is thick and thin lines, we use different colors. It turns out you can make tens of thousands of different combinations of colors and use it for identification. All students who learn how to do something, whether they're doing art or whether they're doing research, love demonstrating and talking about what they do. That is a good thing. We do a lot of demonstrations, students showing off their skills. Um, pe people in State College really like it. And as I said before, this is not just making trinkets. The rule is whenever we do demos, we not only 
demonstrate how to make a paperweight or a vase or something like that, but we also describe the science. So that's what he's doing. While the student is over there blowing a piece, he's talking about what is it about glass that allows you to do that. We can't do these kinds of things with other materials, like metal, for example. There's no way you can do any of this kind of stuff with metal. So we're trying to explain to people what the differences are. And we even took this uh, show on the road uh, with a little grant from the National Science Foundation. I took a group of students to Portugal, uh, where there are much more, at the University of Lisbon, much more into the fine arts. And we got to cross paths with stained glass artists and things like that. It was a really good experience for the students. And now at this university, University of Lisbon, they also have a, a, a glass art and science program. <clears throat> One of the advantages of their program, not only that they have a lot of fine arts students, but they have a conservation science program, and I'll say some things about conservation later on, but conserving old pieces of glass is another interface between scientists and arts, arts, art historians, uh, museum curators, and things like that. They want to know, how can I repair the glass? How can I keep the glass from deteriorating anymore? And so that's uh, an important aspect of what they're doing in this Portugal lab. Another thing I wanted to point out, in fact, I think it would be a great topic for one of these lectures, is you know, we, I've been over there to do this workshop twice, and in both cases we had very, very active debates about, is glass art? The artists today don't consider glass art in much the same way we all consider paintings art. It's a piece of clay turned into a piece of art, that's okay. A piece of metal cast into something, that's okay. But glass is still got a half arm's distance from the artists. And so we had very interesting debates there with the art community about is glass art or is glass just a piece of material that artists can use is a big difference. Of course, students get to work together a lot. That's a great thing. And uh, th this is my Christmas present from my graduate students a few years ago. This was just a photograph they made for me. These four guys are PhD students. And they put this little picture together just because I guess they were having fun one night making some pieces. And before I get away from glass art, I, as I said before, we're not artists. We're not trying to be artists. We're trying to cross the boundaries between the two. But I thought it would be important to at least mention who are the leading uh, master blowers and master glass artists. And you know, I'm sure everyone has their own opinions. But uh, I would say most people would first think of Lino Tagliapietra. Uh, he was born in Venice, Italy, on the island of Murano. He told me he had a pipe in his hand before he was five years old. His wrists are the size of my thigh. He can pick up 200 pounds of glass and spin it like it's nothing. He actually still works a little bit with glass. And he's fairly well known for this Venetian style where he takes the glass on the, on the pipe and wraps it in fibers and, and, and cane. And uh, you know anybody can wrap it this way, but as you can see from his pieces, he has a way of wrapping it in different ways, even crazy angles like that. So he's fairly well known. And then uh, the, the somebody who worked under Lino for a couple of years and then came back to the U.S. and has probably emerged as one of the leading names is Dale Chihuly. And he, of course, is known for some of these very, very large pieces, uh, which I talk to the students about all the time. You know, these pieces are so large, uh, they're meant to be sea forms to give the feeling of water and the sea. And uh, you can see the ripple effect in there that gives that feeling. But there's an engineering purpose to it, in my opinion, because these pieces are so big that they would probably bend and crack under their own weight. But just like corrugated cardboard is stronger than flat cardboard, by having these ripples around the outside and, uh, and down the walls, I think it's strengthening the piece and at the same time adding the artistic or the sensory uh, objective that Dale has in making those pieces. And I just put this one in because I remember there was an article in the New York Times last year about David Salvadore. Uh, he and his three sons are really awesome to watch blow a piece. Uh, they make these glass guitars. Everything is glass with the exception of the dobble in the back and the strings. It takes them a couple hours to make one of these. If you ever have an opportunity to see one, it's pretty impressive. And uh, just one more example of the glass art thing. Um, today I see a lot of artists trying to represent science with art in much the same way the glass flowers represent the science and the um, biology of plants, um, particularly life, DNA and cells. Life science is one of the hottest science topics today. I see a lot of artists trying to represent 
um, DNA and life with art. Um, and, th and that's what this is. This is supposed to be some kind of a coiled up piece of DNA, but you can see there are a lot of other examples where artists are representing science and nature with their pieces. Skip by that one. And uh, so now I'd like to kind of transition into some discussion about glass, the material. Not, as I said, it won't be too uh, trying from a scientific point of view, but I'd like you all to walk away with a little bit more knowledge about glass than maybe you had technically knowledge about glass than you had before you come in, came in. And one of the things that um, I find most people still have a lot of confusion about is bullet here number one. There are lots of people still running around believing that glass is liquid. And um, even I found a high school science book that's less than five years old that tells students that glass is a liquid and that the windows are wider at the bottom because they've been flowing for 100 years and, and nothing could be further from the truth. Scientifically, the only thing that glass has in common with a liquid is that it was made from a liquid and that it has the atomic structure of a liquid, but it doesn't have a single property of a liquid. Every property we look at, change the temperature, the property dependencies don't look like liquids, they look like solids. So point one is I wanted to make sure at least everyone here heard my opinion, and it's not just mine, it's everyone's, I would say, in the scientific community. Glass is a solid based upon everything we know. Another thing is glasses need not be transparent. Uh, there are lots of glasses that are opaque. Glasses need not be made by melting and freezing a liquid. We have other ways of making glasses today, and I, of course, don't have time to go into that, uh, but I just wanted to point that out. However, there are some things we don't know about glass that we still seek, and one I will talk about before we're done is the fact that glass is still brittle and breakable. Even a four-year-old knows that if they drop glass, it not only is going to break, but if they touch it, it's going to cut them. No scientific fact known by kids any sooner than that one, in my opinion, and we still don't know how to fix it. But one thing I'll tell you right now, and I'll tell you more later on, is glass could be the strongest material we own. Certainly in the laboratory, it can be stronger than piano wire. And we understand why it's not able to achieve that strength on an everyday basis. We just don't know how to make it happen. So that's still a challenge, but it's not a mystery. Uh, glass has a disordered structure, as I'll show you in a view graph coming up, and we don't really understand how to control that disordered structure. We know that it's controlling the properties of the glass, but we don't really know what to do about that. And maybe I'm going to skip a couple, but I do want to jump down to this last one. Uh, one of the drivers right now in the field, as I mentioned before, energy is a big concern to everyone. And making glass generally costs energy. You have to put a lot of heat in. And finding ways to reduce the energy cost of glass manufacture is something that we could also take on as a challenge. And there are certainly lots of people working on that. Uh, <clears throat> So there's lots of things about glass I'd like to tell you. There's a lot of words on here. I'm just going to make a couple of points. One is I just want to reiterate the first point I made, which is what differentiates glass from other materials, and I'll show it to you pictorially in, in just a minute, is that it's not crystalline. It doesn't have an ordered structure, and I'll show you what that means in a picture. But I also wanted to just emphasize the other unique thing about glass that makes glass different from other materials, and that is that when we take solid glass, like the window glass, or the display off my screen here, and heat it up. It's, it, when, it, when it melts, it becomes a liquid gradually. The temperature goes up, it goes from solid to, let's say, something syrupy to something that's less syrupy, and eventually gets to something that's all, all over. Think about ice, okay? Just another material, right? When you heat ice up, does it get syrupy, thick, and then slow? No. It's a different material. Ice is a crystal. Glass is a disordered material. And it has this unique property which comes from that disorder, which is that it softens gradually. And likewise, when you cool it, it solidifies. It solidifies slowly, or gradually, I should say. And that's what allows us to hold the shape while we're trying to blow something on a pipe or pull fibers. We can't do that with other materials. Again, let's go back to ice. You put water in the refrigerator, and if you remember, maybe a few of us remember ice cube trays. If you went into the freezer, after you put the tray of water in there and it hadn't quite frozen all the way through and you push your finger down there, you don't feel something syrupy. There's either solid, the ice, or liquid, the water. There's no in-between. It's a very unique characteristic of glass. It's really what makes it what it is. If it didn't have that property, 
I wouldn't be here today. We'd be just, everything would be the same. So that's a very unique thing. We'd love to be able to get that in other materials. We just don't necessarily know how. Another thing that I just want to emphasize is most people know glass has sand as a raw material. But that's not the only thing in glass. You can put almost everything else in the periodic table with the sand to make the most common glasses we know. There are other kinds of glasses, but most glasses that we all work with, and certainly the ones I'll talk about today, have sand as a raw material. But the other things with the sand can be anything and everything from the periodic table. So my point is, not all glasses are the same. Window glass is different than the glass that I use for my display screen and for other things, and it has to do with these other ingredients that are in there. There's lots of ways to process glass, to, con to make shapes out of it. Again, you think about metals, you have to put them on lays and cut them and throw a lot of waste away. There are lots of things we can do with glass that you can't do with other materials that can be advantageous. You can float it. You can cast it, you can press it, you can blow it, you can fiberize it. Lots of things we can do. I'll give you a few examples of those. And of course, there are lots and lots of applications depending upon which one of these processes you use and which one of these properties that you need. Certainly one of the properties that we depend upon most in glass is its optical transparency. Again, that doesn't mean it's transparent to humans. There are lots of optical signals that we put through glass that uh, the glass is opaque in the visible. Our eyes couldn't see through it but certainly the infrared sensors on missiles and, and, and now um, night vision for cars is based upon infrared, where the glass is actually not transparent to the naked eye. So I mentioned the disordered structure of glass. Again, I'm not going to go too much into this, but I just wanted to point out that most materials on the, that we work with are crystals. Crystals means the atoms, that's what you're looking at here. Red, at, red is one kind of atom. Uh, oxygen, the other is titanium, and most materials have this ordered structure, meaning like if you are stacking up cannonballs, you know, they're all lined up, packed close together. And if I looked at that titanium atom versus that one, its surroundings look the same. Here's glass. It's disordered. That's what makes it different from crystalline materials. That's what changes its properties. And this disorder is what gives it the special properties that I, I mentioned in the in the previous view graph. One of the things that this kind of a disordered structure does is it allows things to get inside glass, and that's something we really take advantage of. By the way, what you're looking at here is what some of our students do today, and one of the drivers for me creating this program. We can make glass on a computer, and we can study what it does on a computer. So what you're looking at here is a water molecule. A water molecule cannot enter the structure of a crystalline material. The atoms are packed too close together. But when we make glass, because of the disorder, it leaves big openings in there. And as you can see, the water can get inside. And that can be both problematic and advantageous, depending upon the properties uh, that we're trying to develop. But this is a unique characteristic of glass. And I point it out because we're going to do some things later in the talk where, where this is important. Now, we do know how to make glass where water can't get in. It's not always easy. Here's a glass where we put some other atoms in. They're aluminum atoms. That's what the blue ones are. And you can see that it slowed this down. It can get in there, but it's moving much slower. Both of these are speeded up over real time, of course. And eventually, this one will get stuck, and it just won't be able to go any further. So the point I'm trying to make is, yes, glass has this unique property that things can get inside that's advantageous, but we do know how to do things to it to make it unable to do that. I'd like to say a few things about the processing of glass. Again draw on history. One of the first processes we had for making things out of glass after somebody found molten uh, material at the bottom of a campfire, trying to think about how they were going to shape it, was the blowpipe. There's a lot of debate over when the blowpipe first appeared, uh, but the blowpipe is something that gave a lot of inspiration to things that happened afterwards. Uh, pictures like this give me inspiration to make sure that I force my students to practice safety. We don't allow any of this in my studio. Even though my students want to blow glass with sandals and shorts on, I don't allow it. But in any case, the blowpipe goes back a long way. Um, in the turn of the century in the US and in the UK, um, you know, there were facilities like this one here where there's a big furnace with a lot of heat inside and many workmen on the outside with blowpipes all working at the same time to make things out of glass. So this is turn of the century compared to that last picture. And, um, and that led to 
blowing into a mold so that you could better control the shape. And again, I'm just showing now the transition to what we do in manufacturing. This is a machine in a factory that you could find anywhere around the, uh, around the world today uh, making beer bottles. The current machine makes 600 beer bottles a minute, and it's no different than this process over here. It's just that the machine is doing it, not two humans. <clears throat> Here's an interesting point I started to, to make before, a process that was developed by the Venetians a very, very long time ago. Some of you may know this stuff by the name Millefiore. It's used to make jewelry. It's embedded in paperweights. Um, it's used for various kinds of art pieces. Uh, some people call it Marini. Uh, basically, the process I wanted to show you is something that I think is reminiscent of how we make fiber optics from what we call a preform. And what they do here is they'll start with a mold, they'll take one color of glass, squeeze it in there to make a star shape on there, and then take this star shape after it's solidified and dip it into another glass of a different color and wrap the star with a different color glass. Now you can imagine if I cut slices out of this, each slice has a star in it. And we would call this a preform. Of course, you can do it a lot fancier than this. You can put many different things around it. You can even make a mold where you put very thin fibers of different colors and make a picture. So this picture goes all the way through a long piece of cane like that. And if you now look at an optical fiber, what Ava mentioned earlier, which is carrying our internet and telephone signals around, what an optical fiber is, it's one kind of glass that we call the core of an optical fiber surrounded by another kind of glass, just like we've done here. The only difference is here we're not trying to make something decorative, we're trying to make something that guides light. And the light pulses that carry our internet signals and our telephone messages are trapped in the core. And by having this glass around the outside, it, the light can't get out. Even if we bend the fiber, the light will be guided along. And again, I've always felt like the inspiration for the process for making optical fiber came from this idea up here. And here's the process that's one of the processes that's used to make optical fiber today is to take a rod of one kind of glass and stick it inside of a tube of the other one and just stretch it. And again, this is just like the preform that Millefiore was based upon. As I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> another area where glass and science, glass history, glass art, and science come together is in the area of conservation, uh, conserving old glass pieces, taking care of them so that they'll last longer is what that's all about. And one of the best examples, and one where there's a lot of concern about degradation of the glass, is, are the so-called glass flowers at Harvard. Uh, I'm told that this is one of the top five visitor sites in, in the Boston area. Lots of people want to go there. Um, there are 3,000 models of different kinds of plants. What you're looking at here is all made out of glass. In fact, if any, I, I have one leaf of glass. If anybody wants to see it later on, I'll, I'll bring it over to the coffee area. This is all glass, different colors, as you can see. Every part made individually and then assembled father and son by the name of the Blaschkas in Germany did this. The son spent his entire life doing this, his entire life. His father was originally making artificial glass eyes and was contacted by Harvard, was asked, could you make models of plants for us? We want to replace the wax models that we're using. And uh, he agreed to it. And what he didn't learn, he sent his son off to college to learn how to do, and he took over the business. And uh, again, you can see the properties of glass allow you to do some of this. And notice these little, little uh, stringers on the edges of this plant. It would be very hard to do that with wax or any other kind of a material, paper mache, the other kinds of things that are used. But with glass, again, you can imagine these two guys with a torch just pulling each one of those one at a time. None of this was done with a mold. Everything was done by hand and flames. Each one of these needles was made individually and then assembled. They even made cross-sections of the stems and seeds of plants out of glass. And all of this you can find in the, in the museum at Harvard. And here's just one that I worked on, which I got involved in this because some of the plants are showing degradation. So this white stuff you see here and here is corrosion. The first 50 years that these flowers were on display at Harvard, they did not have air conditioning in the museum. So there's moisture in the summer. And the water reaction I told you about before, here's one example of it. Long time in a moist environment with heat, the water will eventually get inside the glass and cause it to deteriorate. Most people find it counterintuitive that glass corrodes, but it does. 
And when I study this stuff, I use electron microscopes. And so if you want to know what is that white stuff, they're complicated, there are lots of things, but one of the most common characteristics when we look at old glass, including old stained glass from the churches in Europe, is that it looks at the microscopic level. Again, this is a very high magnification. You couldn't pick this up with your eye. It looks like a mud puddle, you know, mud that has, you know, right after the sun comes out and it starts to dry, it starts to crack. This is the glass surface that has cracked because the water got in there and softened it, and then when it dries out, moisture causes it to shrink. And this is also one of the reasons glass isn't so strong. And you only need one of these little cracks to weaken the material. And now we've flipped it around, as I mentioned before. We're now thinking about putting nuclear waste, meaning radioactive atoms that we want to keep out of the biosphere. We're thinking about storing that in glass. And I think many of you perhaps have heard about nuclear waste disposal in glass. Lots of people think it means taking glass jars and putting the nuclear waste inside and sealing it, but that's not what it means. What it means is melting glass the way we melt window glass, but throwing some of the radioactive atoms in there. And if we do that, then those radioactive atoms get trapped in that disordered structure that I showed you before. And if the radioactive atom is in there, we don't have to worry about it because it can't get into the water you know, in the water table unless the glass dissolves. It can't get into my body unless the glass dissolves. So this now becomes a problem of keeping the radionuclear, making a glass that doesn't dissolve, that doesn't undergo those water reactions that we talked about earlier. And how are we going to figure out how long a glass like this can last without dissolving? Well, this is where we went to the art historians, particularly um, people with uh, old pieces. So here's a glass vase from the Roman times, 250 AD. I asked a couple of my grad students to do some 100-year experiments. Nobody went for it. But this is a 2,000-year experiment. This was found in the ground. It was buried in mud, was exposed to moisture. So we're asking the question, how long can we bury nuclear waste in the ground and know it's safe? Here's an experiment that we could do. And in fact, it's already been done. The blue glass that you see on this vase has cobalt in it. Over the 2,000 years this glass was in the ground, it was slowly dissolving, and the cobalt atoms were migrating away from the piece. By measuring the migration trail, we can calculate over these 2,000 years how much of the glass dissolved and how far an atom could get away in 2,000 years. That information is now being used in models to predict how long the nuclear waste that they want to bury in Nevada will be safe if water ever gets in there. And we know water will eventually get in there. I mean, it will happen eventually because the nuclear waste is going to be there forever. So this is a place where we're using art history and conservation to help us sci solve a scientific problem. Um, here's another example of a crossover that's kind of interesting. Uh, I get lots of calls from glass artists asking me, Carlo, I read about this new glass and I want to build it into my next art pieces. Tell me about it. Or what's the latest coating for glass that I can use for my art? Well, here's a case where an artist found out about a material called aerogel, which is a glassy material. It's, um, I won't go into too much detail about how it's made, but aerogel is a very interesting material. It's lightweight. It's 99% air. The rest is glassy silica. And it's an excellent um, thermal insulator. So here's a torch on the bottom of a plate of aerogel, and you can see that this rose has not been wilted at all. Here's what it looks like when you hold it in your hand. Some people call it solid smoke because it's kind of a blue cast and it's very, very low density. But what this artist decided to do was to take advantage of it because it plays with light in a very different way than other materials do, including typical solidified or typical kinds of glass. So he would make objects out of this aerogel material and then shine different kinds of light on it to make art pieces. For example, this one here. So he has an aerogel, which he's shining light on, but this is, in fact, his piece, the reflection of light that comes through it and around it and things of that sort. Uh, here's another one. We had him at Penn State for a week. Uh, people in material science were interested to find out how he was doing this, and the artists were interested in it. Uh, very, very interesting artist. Again, he took a new material to make art out of. So to wrap up, Got a few more things, and tell me when to stop. Like I said, I'll keep talking otherwise. 
Uh, but I, the last part, I just wanted to kind of go through a few other things that I thought you might find interesting. I'm just kicking that off by saying, you know, there's been a Stone Age, a Bronze Age, and an Iron Age, but in my opinion, glass just keeps giving. Every time we think it's run out of steam, it comes back again. In fact, you might be interested to know that the National Academy of Engineering came up with the 12 most important engineering achievements of the last 100 years, and glass was in seven of them. Optical fibers being one of them, the light bulb machine being another, float glass, which I'll tell you about being another. So glass really has been important to society uh, over as long as we've had history. So I'm going to just rattle through a few things. You know, when I was in school, microcircuits and microelectronics was the hot thing. Today we have integrated optics. Instead of electrons running around a computer chip, we have light pulses that come out of the fibers. And we're doing math with them. And eventually, we'll maybe do other things with them. But this is a new area for glass, integrated optics. I mentioned earlier that glass slides are the substrate, very special kinds of glass slides, not the kind we use in chem lab, special glass slides that you can print DNA on. And the Human Genome Project depended extensively on so-called DNA microarrays. And the glass was a, a substrate on which different strands of DNA could be placed and they could be analyzed to find out what the genetics were. Uh, glass has become very important for exploring in outer space. Not only space telescopes like the Hubble, which was made out of a very special glass uh, manufactured by Corning and processed by Kodak. Uh, this glass has zero thermal expansion. It neither expands nor contracts as you heat and cool it around room temperature. Very unique compared to most other materials. Uh, glass has turned out to be very important for energy conservation. Uh, it hasn't gotten around enough. You know, if we would put what are called low emissivity glass windows into all homes in the United States alone, we could have a huge positive impact on energy conservation. The problem is, of course, most, most homes already have glass windows in them and it can be costly to replace them, but low emissivity glass, I'm sure many of you know about it, is designed to, you know, keep cool air in the building if you happen to live in a hot climate or keep cold air outside your home if you happen to live in a cold climate. And it's based upon coatings that are put on modern day glass. But the one thing we haven't been able to achieve with glass, I just gave you four examples of things that have kind of gone forward because we understand a lot about glass. As I mentioned earlier, there's this whole business of the brittleness and the strength of glass. And that's why pictures like this get people's attention. And again, I remember two summers ago, the New York Times had an article about glass when they were fixing the windows in the Empire State Building. And then when Chicago's Sears Tower put this little box, I don't know how many people have seen this, but they built a glass box that sticks out from the second to the top floor of the Sears Tower. And as you can see, some kids aren't afraid. So I mean, she's basically laying on glass and there's nothing below her except this little box that's holding her up there. And I think what triggered the articles in the paper was, aren't we worried about this stuff cracking and breaking into pieces? And so there were a lot of interviews that were taken from scientists, and we were, many of us were misquoted, unfortunately. Uh, another place where people ask about the strength of glass is the Grand Canyon Lookout. So this is a lookout that extends out over, um, I forgot how high it is, but it's higher, than, it's higher than the Empire State Building in terms of how far it is down down below. And in fact, they're so concerned about damage to the glass, you can see people are wearing booties so they don't scratch up the glass. And there are lots of things we could do if we could make stronger glass. You know, cell phones and things like that, people want to be able to stick them in and out of their pocket. Um, glass fiber um, windmills, glass fiber reinforced windmills. If the glass was stronger, we could get more power out of the windmills because we put less weight on them displays that we all enjoy for televisions in our homes and things like that. The glass is getting bigger and bigger and keeping it strong is the key question here. And as I mentioned before, uh, saving energy is a big deal. And if we can make glass stronger, because what we do today, because glass is brittle and it, and it can fail, is we just make it thicker. We use more glass so that it doesn't break. But if we can make it intrinsically stronger, then we could reduce the weight of glass. And, and if we reduce the weight of glass, then we could reduce the energy consumption. So why is glass brittle? As I said before, it's not a mystery. We know. We know that it's brittle because it has very small micro cracks in its surface. And if you think about it, if you tried to bend that glass or if you dropped it on the ground and it hit on an edge, it would try to bend. 
All you're going to do is open those cracks up. And because of the internal structure of the glass, what we call fracture toughness, it's not very high in, in, in glassy material, this, these cracks can extend. Now, well, how do we know that glass can be stronger? We know that because people can make pieces of glass in a laboratory and not touch it. If you don't touch it, you won't get any cracks on the surface. And if you cool it very carefully, you won't get any cracks on the surface. And under those circumstances, it can exhibit strengths on the order of one to two million pounds per square inch of tensile strength. And if you put a coating on it to protect it from getting scratched, you can keep it that way, perhaps for a longer time. But the fact of the matter is, when we manufacture glass today, before the glass even gets out of the factory, it's got some scratches on it. And that's the problem we have to deal with, is how to maintain the surface smooth and, and micro crack or nano crack free. You can't see these cracks. They're below the resolution of your eye. The only product that I know of that has been able to solve this problem is in the fiberglass area, whether it's fiberglass reinforcements or optical fibers, because as you manufacture these glasses, they're made by pulling on the glass and, and drawing it. You can put a coating on it immediately, and you can protect it. Uh, but even there, there's some strength loss, maybe from a million PSI down to 500 or 600,000 PSI. So we understand the problem, and there are people working on it uh, on a regular basis. Uh, another solution to this problem, however, is something that you may have heard about. It's a different solution. It's called Gorilla Glass. And it's based on, upon a process that's been known for probably 50 years, but there's never really been a big application that brought it into consumer products. It's certainly been used in highly technical engineered products, but not into consumer products. And the basic idea behind Gorilla Glass, which is used on Androids, Apple phones, and a variety of things, is you start out with your piece of glass that you want to strengthen. So the whole idea of this is to make the glass stronger and not to be concerned about those cracks. So let's suppose I'm making the faceplate for an, an Apple iPhone. After it's been cut to the right size, the little holes that are there and the little finger thing is there, you dip it, as she's doing here, into a salt. This glass has in its structure, going back to that picture I showed you earlier, sodium ions. And let's just call sodium ions these red things that have that size. The bath of salt that she's going to dip the glass into has potassium ions in them. And you can see that they're bigger than the sodium ions. When you put that piece of glass in the salt, in the salt bath, it's heated up. And when it heats, the glass expands. And when it expands, the, so the potassium ions that are in the salt go inside the glass for some of the reasons I gave before. And the sodium ions that are in the glass come out of the glass. And this is called ion exchange. We're just exchanging their places while they're hot. Now you take the piece of glass out of there and you let it cool. And when it cools, we've put a big ion in a small hole. And so everything is compressed. They're squeezing on one another. So now let's go back to this picture. Suppose this surface had compression in it from that effect. It would push these cracks closed. Even if I tried to bend this glass, I would not be able to open the crack. It's as if someone's in there squeezing them closed. The other thing that Gorilla Glass does is it makes it hard to get a new scratch. Because by having compression, by having those atoms squeezing on one another, if I come on the surface here with a, with a sharp tool like a knife and drag it across there, it can't cause a scratch because a scratch requires that you break bonds. And you can't break the bonds because the atoms are being squeezed together. And that's what Gorilla Glass is, ion exchange strengthening. You can see here a piece of glass that none of us would ever try to do with our own hands uh, because we know it would break before we could even see any curvature. But here you can see the curvature of the glass. And again, this bottom surface, even though there are probably cracks, very small cracks there, they can't open because of this chemical compression that's squeezing things closed. And I was going to show you a movie about it, but we'll save that for later. Another, another place uh, where glass is being used more and more is in architecture. And a lot of that is you know, right here in New York City, uh, all around the world. Uh, glass, even though it's brittle, we've got... We've improved on it slowly. People have more faith in it, and they, it's being used more and more in architecture. Um, I'll skip over that one and that one. Um, I just wanted to talk about something that you might be familiar with, and that's the, the Trade Tower, uh, the New World Tower One, which up until, I guess, about a year ago, I think it was May of 2011, the idea was to take the bottom 20 floors, which is a blast-proof bunker, 
and it looked kind of boring to the architects and they wanted to do something and so they decided to put what's called prism glass on it. However, after they put some of that prism glass on, they ran into problems that it was fracturing and falling off the wall. And I just thought I would tell you a little bit about what I learned about prism glass. Some of my students asked me about this. First of all, here's the original prism glass that was made, I don't know, 100 years ago. It was used in ships. And the whole idea of prism glass was to get light down into the hull of the ship. So they'd mount big hunks of this, maybe some of them were this big, on the, on the deck, would grab light from the sun, and what a prism does is it bends light. It bends all the light, and it bends each color a little bit differently, so it also produces rainbows. So that's what prism glass was developed for. Another use of it, by the way, was in stores. It, back when we were working with gas lighting, if you had a clothing store, for example, you didn't want gas lights in there because it made a lot of black soot and it got all over the clothes. So what they would do is they would put another kind of prism glass, this stuff here. So the piece of glass has a whole bunch of little prisms on it, and that's what all this glass is up here. It collects light from the sun and it directs it into the back of the store. So there was a lot of prism glass around for that reason. Uh, my understanding is that for the World Trade, or for the Trade Tower One, uh, what they wanted to do was put this glass here so that it would reflect colors. I don't know that it ever achieved that. In fact, I tried to get more information about this and almost all the companies who were involved have been told by their lawyers they're not allowed to talk about it. So there must still be, there must still be money on the table. But basically, this is the material they, were, they thought they were putting in there. And I believe the reason it's failing is because if you look at this kind of glass, you can see that it has narrow places in there. They're almost like scratches. It weakens the glass. My guess is the building moves a little bit too and the glass just can't tolerate it. That's about as much information I, as I could get. But I actually enjoyed looking this stuff up because I didn't really know about this aspect of the use of prism glass. Last thing I'll tell you about, and I think we're OK on time then, uh, is a really wild pro project that I got involved with because the, the wild guy who came up with this idea Googled glass people on the web, and my name popped up. And he's come up with this idea called solar roadways. And he considers it a solution to renewable energy and a whole host of other things. And the basic idea is shown here. Um, you know, a lot of road surfaces today are not even made on the road anymore. They're prefab panels that you carry to the road surf and they just stack them up. He came up with the idea because he saw this and he remembered as a kid playing with slot cars. He came up with the idea of why don't we make these panels not out of concrete that we're just going to lay down on dirt, but why don't we make each panel a photovoltaic panel? And why don't we put wiring underneath it to carry electric that it's collecting all over the United States at the same time and be the grid for the United States? So one idea is that it's, it's a power grid. Another idea is roads are everywhere. And cars aren't on the road all the time. So there's lots of time when they're just sitting there baking in the sun. Why not use that rather than take Yellowstone Park and cover it with solar panels? And then one other aspect of this that's kind of interesting. So here's his conception. You could also have LEDs built in there so that you can put signs on the road and things of that sort. But one other really interesting aspect of his idea is that electric vehicles, which I think we all know we're going to eventually be 100% electric vehicle, um, you could just charge them up anywhere along the road. We don't have to worry so much about what everybody's worried about now, which is what happens when I run out of juice. We've got, so, so here are some of the advantages of this project. It's a, it's a smart grid, the end of fossil fuels. We can recharge on it. It's 100% renewable, and it's good use of highway infrastructures. Of course, there are some problems, one of which is if you want to put photovoltaics in the road, you need a transparent material. And one question is, can glass do the job? And there's lots of questions about that, not the least of which is it's strong enough, but also, does it have traction? And I was contacted about helping out with the traction thing. And my response was, why don't we rethink the problem? Why don't you get rid of the tires? I think that'll be easier <laughs> than trying to solve. And, and I'm not sure that that's totally out of the question. But one of the things I learned was, is, is right here in New York City, there's textured glass somewhere. I'm going to try to find this while I'm here this weekend. If anybody knows, let me know after the talk. Oh, walking distance. So anyway, th this is textured glass, sidewalk. And I was interested in this because we think that the solution to 
the traction issue is we need textured glass. And uh, the only textured glass that I could find out anything about that's been in use is this sidewalk glass that's on 30th and 7th, so I'm going to go check it out. But we are working with the company that made that sidewalk glass. They're trying out some new designs some of my students and I came up with to enhance the traction on this. So I'm going to end there. Uh, I hope what I had to say was interesting and I didn't bore you for too much. And uh, thanks for your attention. And when I saw Ava's list that your advertisement that this was two hours, I thought we were going to have a nice long discussion. So I put some of my questions on this screen. Oh, I got that. Um, first of all, I, I hope you got to see the wonderful exhibit at the Museum of Art and uh, Design on the glass exhibit. I don't know if it's still there, Columbus Circle, but anyway. Oh, oh okay. Um, maybe you should go. Um, I was fascinated by the mixing of the art students and the engineering students. And I'd like a little more, when they came to the project, did each of them have their own idea of what they were going to do, or did you give them an assignment? And how did they interact? Well, some of them interacted well, in the sense that the engineering students wanted some help. The engineering students often ask for some help with conceiving an idea. The art students always ask for some help making their idea reality. I mean, they generally knew what they wanted to do, and they just didn't know how to get there. The engineering students could probably do a lot of different things, but didn't know what they wanted to make. And generally, they ended up making what came off the bench. And anybody who's blown glass, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. You know, a lot of times, you think you're in control of the glass, but the glass is in control of you. And I think the engineers let the glass tell them what it, what it was, whereas, whereas the art students really clearly knew what they wanted to do. A lot of times I didn't think it was all that interesting, but they knew what they wanted to do. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Uh, I had a question about the use of glass for uh, storing nuclear waste and the idea of using historical information. But based on that, have people made models and have they then used those concepts to do things like accelerated aging so that you can get a real sense of, of how... Well, we've, we've been doing accelerated aging for a long while, but most of us are very leery of it because we're accelerating way too much. I mean, this stuff has to last hundreds, thousands of years. And accelerated tests aren't bad for accelerating the life of a, you know, two-year life of a bottle, <laughs> but not so much here. So a lot of it is model dependent. A lot of it is model dependent. And just finding out how long it takes for an ion to diffuse out of the glass, into the dirt, uh, and things like that, turn out to be critical things. And these, these models are multi-scale. They start at the atomic level, and they end up at the ge geologic level. And you can find tons on it if you're interested. Uh, yes. Yeah, um did Steve Jobs have anything to do with that Gorilla Glass? Because I know that he wanted, there was something they were going to make it in China, and then they thought it would be too expensive, and they were, and Corning then picked it up. Yeah, well, I think, uh, I, I know for a fact Apple was looking for stronger glass. They were the first to use so much glass in a smartphone. The first iPhone, if you remember, had, or the second iPhone, had glass on the back, glass on the front. The glass on the back was colored. It wasn't intended to be trans it wasn't intended to transmit anything. They liked the feel of glass and the feel of the aluminum. So they wanted stronger glass because they wanted to construct the phone out of, out of the glass. And I think they went to a lot of places for it. Corning doesn't make the strengthened glass. Anybody can strengthen the glass Corning sells. So when you buy the glass, it's just what we'd call raw gorilla. It's not strong yet. And that's all Corning sells. And then Apple can take it to China and have it configured into their phone. Android can take it to wherever they would like to. So I, I don't think Apple developed the technology. I think that they were begging for a stronger glass. And they probably beat on Corning's door the hardest in order to get it. Yes? 
Uh, you mentioned centering on the screen, yeah. and uh, could you explain what that is, please? So, centering is a process where you take particles and pack them together and then heat them up. And when, they, when you heat them up, the particles come closer and closer together. So in other words, this pile of particles becomes a solid object. It doesn't melt. It doesn't become liquid. It's a different process that I won't go into too much detail on, but it shrinks and densifies, takes away all the holes in between the particles. It's actually an art process. Uh, in the glass area, it's called pot du verre. You take glass that's been made by some other process, you make very small particles out of it, and you fill a mold. And then you do the centering process, except you don't go all the way to full density. You leave just some small air pockets in there. And so it makes the thing solidified. In other words, you start with powdery dust, and when you open the mold up, you can pull out a vase, but it's partially centered. And that's what centering is. It's used to make ceramics, it's used to make metals, and it always means taking metal, ceramic, or glass particles, packing them together and heating them up, but not heating them to the melting temperature. Yes? How does um, glass, when you're storing nuclear waste, affect the radiation? Or good does question. It, I mean, is it irrelevant? Very good question. Or, yeah. So, first of all, you know, you, you, uh, let me ask a different question that might help answer that one. Why don't we put nuclear waste, radioactive atoms, in crystalline materials? The reason is the radioactivity actually knocks the atoms off of the positions where they need to be. It can break bonds. And so that material that you started with becomes disordered. That's where the idea to use glass came from in the first place, because if I put radioactive atoms in glass, the radioactivity coming off that atom is not going to break any bonds because it's already disordered. But, so that's, but there is still radioactivity. So, so, so there are two things about radioactivity that I need to remind everyone of. One is the radioactivity. And I don't care if there's a piece of glass here emitting radioactivity, because I can just back up. I can just get away from it. So radioactivity, everybody's worried about, but we can control it. We just have to get away from it. But the, the, the danger in radioactive materials is radioactive contamination or poisoning. A small piece of something that has a radioactive atom in it, I breathe it, it gets into the water, I drink it, something like that, then it gets close to my cells. And just what it can do to a crystalline material, it can do to my DNA. So the real key to waste disposal is trapping it to keep it out of the biosphere. We're not so worried about the radioactivity. Yes? Just a moment. Uh, you know, it's an interesting, that's also a very good question. I mean, I, I think I have a job and I'm busy all the time because you don't get the big picture. Glass stories are in pockets. There's a lot about art glass. There's about historical glass, co glass conservation. Um, it's hard to put the whole story together. For example, I seldom use a textbook in my glass course because there's nothing that covers the breadth of things that I think are important. And it's probably because glass has been around for so long. There's just so many different places that, it, that it's ended up. Um, now let me come back and answer your question in a different way. You could find all of this information, but you'd have to synthesize and put it together. But it's it's out there. Yes. Can you wait for the mic? Oh. Where do you think the most exciting work is being done in glass art or in glass art? Well, that's a tough one. Well, I'm also calling for a, a judgment for you to yeah, make. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you are talking about art. I'm talking. Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I had a chance to visit. You know, the the, the art, the the hardcore fine artists. You know, probably won't agree with me on this, but I had a chance to visit Dale Chihuly's boathouse out in Tacoma, and I just thought that the size and the, quali the quality of the glass that they were making and the size of the pieces that they were making out of it was very impressive to me, that they were, they were really kind of, you know, beyond the boundaries of what most other people have done with glass art. Um, they had to solve problems that I don't think anyone else has had to solve in order to make those large pieces, to get that color, and be honest with you, he's much more than an artist today. He's practically a manufacturing business. The fact that he can reproduce them is, is kind of interesting. So again, I think if there was an art, a fine artist standing here, you know, he or she might be uh, bending over right now, not agreeing with me, but um, 
that, I, I just feel like they've taken glass, what you can do with glass for art purposes to a, to a, to a higher level. Dale Chihuly. Uh, the Heller Brothers on 4th Avenue have a wonderful gallery of art glass with, with uh, over the years, probably hundreds of different artists. And my God, if that isn't art, I don't know what yes, is. Yes, I, I agree with you. You don't have to argue with me. Some of these are twenty, thirty thousand dollar $30,000 pieces. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I had another question. My own observation, having had a, a triple glazed window to block out noise from a playground, the weight of regular glass is terrific. It's yeah. very, very heavy. Yeah. That's what we're trying to solve with stronger glass because that meant a lot of energy being used. Yeah. It meant, that means fuel. It meant a lot of CO2 being generated. That means CO2 footprint and the weight of hoisting it up on buildings. And I think you could, I don't know how many of you are familiar, I, I use it in my sustainability class as a great example what the Empire State Building did when they replaced the glass. I mean, they could have had all new glass melted, and probably in some other country at some lower cost and assembled, but they didn't do that. What they did is, they, well, I think it was a, a startup company went to them with an idea, which was, let us take one floor of the building and turn it into a factory. And what we will do in this one floor factory is we'll take all the old windows out and we'll harvest the glass. Because the glass in that building is really thick. I mean, you got a lot of wind, right? Yeah. And just like the Trade Center. And so they harvested all the glass, cleaned it in this one floor factory. They actually built a, a mini clean room in there, cleaned the glass, re-edged it, and then put it in new frames with coating, with a, it's not the quality coating that you would get if you bought a brand new window, but it's almost the same effectiveness in reflecting the infrared and letting the visible light through. And uh, so, I mean, I, I'm just using that as an example because on the one hand, it takes a lot of energy to make glass, but once you've made it, even recycling it, even remelting it, you save almost 80% of the original energy. And we, we call that embodied energy. When yeah. you take something out of the ground and turn it into something useful, you have to use energy. You have to transport. You have to use raw materials. You have to use fuel. And all of that is called embodied energy. And if you never go back to the ground to make that material again, let's say glass, that embodied energy can be reused over and over again. You may have to put 10% of what you put in originally every time. You know, take Coca-Cola bottles and Pepsi bottles. In the U.S., that's 1% of the market. Outside the U.S., 80 to 90% of Coca-Cola and Pepsi is in glass. Most of those glass bottles have been remelted six or seven times. Wow. I had one other, uh, asbestos. Uh, I, when I was in business, someone was approached the company I was with about the idea of having a furnace and taking the asbestos out of the building, I think in the World Trade yeah. Center. And embed it in glass? And, and embed it in glass. Yeah. I don't know, is that a common technique or not? People have talked about it. I don't know how prevalent it is because, yeah. I mean, I mean same, same theory exists for nuclear waste, by the way, and that is when you have something dangerous, sometimes the lowest risk thing you can do is leave it alone. Like the, a risk analysis has been done with all the spent fuel in the nuclear power plants in the U.S., and the risk analysis says just leave it there. Of course, that's kicking the can down the road, too. Uh, you mentioned recycling glass. Mm -hmm. And I recently went to a recycling center and saw what they did with it, which unfortunately was not that they're going to remelt it and use it you know, in bottles or anything. They just grind it up. And they use it uh, in landfills as filters. And they use it in uh, the asphalt that goes on the street. Mm -hmm. Are, uh, well, there, they're, they're, they're not have to put hardly any more energy in if it's a use. A use. Yeah, they're, they're not, but, but can um, the glass, you know, glass bottles and such uh, be, remelted? be remelted? And is that being done in this, in it's this country? It's being done extensively. Yeah. I'm, you know, I, I was just yeah. seeing that it seemed like an awfully wasteful yeah. way of so dealing with it. So what you saw was what's called mixed color. Yes. You can't take a wine bottle that's brown and a beer bottle that's green or whatever yeah. And, yeah. and throw them in the same tank. So unless they're sorted out, they can't use it for much of remelting. Obviously, they, they probably harvest 80% of that by 
color sorters and things like that, but they always end up with a lot of glass that just ends up being this mixed color. Another big application, which I think will improve, will expand further, is using it as an additive in concrete. You know, I, I mean, the, the, the material that's produced in the largest tonnage worldwide is concrete. Steel is second. Concrete's number one. And if we could replace some of the aggregate and other things that are in there with recycled glass. Problem is that there are some corrosion problems with it that are being worked on. Thing. 